we're, we're able to walk in victory, to overcome. God, because of your grace and your mercy, Lord, we're able to come and to stand before your throne. Lord, not in our own righteousness, but the righteousness of the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. Lord, I pray that tonight as we open your word, Lord, as we continue to discover what it looks like to be a true, authentic follower of Jesus, to be a disciple. God, I pray that, that Lord, you would continue to shape us, that, that, Lord, you would continue to call us to a greater standard, Lord, that you would equip us to live and to mimic and to mirror the very life of Jesus himself. God, what our community needs, God, is not another self-help book. Our community doesn't need just another motivational television program. God, what our community needs is men and women just like us who would take on the responsibility to embody the life of Jesus. That Lord, when we enter our workplaces, when we enter our community, when we enter our extracurricular activities, that Lord, we would embody the same love that Jesus carried out in His day-to-day ministry. God, I know for many of us it's something we think we've mastered. It's something we think we're doing really well at. But but God, the truth is tonight, I think many of us are going to discover that we still haven't arrived. We still don't understand what it means to really love like Jesus loved. And so God, prepare our hearts Lord, I pray that those preconceived ideas in our mind, that, that Lord, we could just suspend all that for a moment. That, God, all that super religion, that, that baggage that we carry, Lord, may we just suspend that for a little while tonight so that we could really grasp what your word says. And God, we'll give you the honor and the glory for what you're going to accomplish in our lives tonight. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated tonight. Well, we are in the middle of our series, Christian. And it is week number five. And so for some of you, uh, you're hitting us right in the middle. And so let me give us a little bit of history and background. Uh, The whole purpose of this series is the reality that that Jesus never called his followers to be Christians. In fact, he, he never used the word Christian to describe his followers because as long as you use the Christian, that, that term Christian, you could be anything you want to be. The Bible doesn't define Christian. It's used how many times in Scripture? Three times. And it's something that the outsiders called those on the inside following Jesus. Kind of like nerds and rednecks don't call themselves nerds or rednecks. But people who observe their life call them nerds and rednecks. The same thing's true of the believer in the first century church. They didn't call themselves Christians, but people who watched how they lived and saw that they were mimicking Jesus Christ called them Christians. But rather, Jesus called his followers something else. And it's, it's a word that's a little more precise it's, it's something that can be defined and, and really honed in on. And that term was what? Disciple. To be a disciple, to be a follower, to be a student, a pupil, um, to mimic and to mirror the life of Jesus. And so the truth is, if I were to go out today and ask ten people to define Christian, I would probably get ten different answers. And if I were to take all ten answers, probably 70% of them wouldn't even come up with some sort of scriptural background. Um, it, here's the reality. We, we know this to be true because it doesn't matter what the issue is. Whether it's a political issue, a financial issue, a social issue, I promise you, you could find people who claim to be Christian on both sides of the issue. Because as long as we use that word, we can ultimately be anything we want to be. But we want to be followers of Jesus, we want to be disciples, and we want to see what scripture says. And so last weekend, we talked about being two things. We talked about being, do you remember? Salt and light. The Bible's really clear that a follower of Jesus 
ought to be salt and light. Salt always does what? Preserves. Light always shows the way. You can't argue with that. Tonight we're going to kind of dig in a little bit further. Um, we, we discovered in like weeks one and two that we've been called to love like Jesus. In fact, we are supposed to love one another. That, that sets us apart. In fact, John uh, says in his gospel, John chapter 13, verse 35, it says, by this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, John's gospel didn't say everyone will know that you are a Christian by your weekly church attendance. John's gospel didn't say everyone will know that you are a Christian as long as you dress up and wear your shirt and tie to weekend worship. Jesus gave something very direct and specific and said, people will know you are my disciples. People will know you are my follower if you love one another. Now, he went on to say that he wants you to love how? How are we to love one another? As he has loved us. Let me ask you a question. Just be real honest with me tonight. Let's just be vulnerable if we can. I mean, after all, it's a small group. There's nobody in direct line of the camera, so nobody's going to see you on the internet later. And so here's the question for you tonight. How many of you all at one time were a messed up, jacked up, up to your eyeball sinner? And how did Jesus love you? He loved you enough to redeem you. He loved you enough to rescue you. He loved you enough to give you an eternity in heaven. He loved you enough to, to give you a second chance. And for many of you, a third and a fourth and a fifth, and some of you are like up here already. Okay? See, Jesus distinctly loved in such a way that, that for some of us, let's be real honest. We can't wrap our minds around the way Jesus loved. So tonight I want to talk about the dynamic that Jesus brought when he loved others. In fact, I've got four words I want to throw up here on the screen. And really, when it comes to the way Jesus loved, the way that Jesus loved people, oftentimes it was messy. It was inconsistent. It could even be looked at as unfair and even confusing. I mean, if you look throughout Scripture and you see the way that Jesus interacted with others, you would say that his love was messy, it was unfair, maybe it's inconsistent, and ultimately it leaves you confused. And, and the truth and the reality is, for those of us that are super spiritual, religious, and we're carrying our baggage from that, this, this makes us uneasy. This really bothers us. It kind of uh, causes what I would say is spiritual tension. We have spiritual tension because we tend to want to lean to one extreme or the other. Okay? Jesus didn't lead and love to one extreme or the other. And so tonight we're going to unpack that a little bit. Because what tends to happen for us we, we do our best, we want to mimic, and we want to mirror Jesus' love, but for those of us that tend to be a little more conservative, when we try to walk this out, and we try to love like Jesus, when, when we do that, we tend to come way over here, and, and we go to the extreme of being judgmental. But then, then on the other side, we, we come over here and, and there's those that say, you just need to love like Jesus. In fact, the Bible says you should not judge. And, and over here it would appear that there's no absolutes. The only absolutes is don't be a jerk like the conservative over there. And, and so this tension, you know, the, the tension happens in like over here, we're afraid that somebody might get away with something. Right? And, and over here, over here it's like you're being a little too mushy in your love for Jesus and loving people. And so most people, what do they want to do? 
They want to find a, a balance. Most people, they want to find that fine line between the two. And it's a tension. It's like we, we, want to, we want to love like Jesus, and we want to call sin, sin. But we want to love like Jesus over here, and we want to say things like, love the sinner, hate the sin. And it's like we just are in this tension of how do we do that? We're trying to bring it to, to middle ground, and, and it makes us uncomfortable. But all throughout Scripture, all throughout Scripture, you see both. You see both. And for us, in humanity, sitting here tonight in Sykeston, Missouri in 2013, when we begin to look at the way Jesus interacted and loved people, it's often messy. It's confusing. It's inconsistent. Sometimes it's maybe even unfair. Now, if you're taking notes tonight, you want to write this down. Okay? It's a tension. There's a tension. An attention that we often tempt to resolve. Most of us, when we feel this spiritual tension, we want to resolve it. But hear me tonight. If you resolve it, you lose something. If you resolve it, you will lose something. You will lose the ability, listen to me, you will lose the ability to love the way Jesus called us to love. If you try to resolve this tension between the two, you're not going to be able to love the way that Jesus loved. In fact, I see I see evidence of this in our church. I see evidence of this in our church. You, you, you see, we, we attract people who maybe come from a, a background where they were hurt in church or, or maybe they're, they're not even churched at all and um, they come from a rough background and, and maybe, uh, maybe they come and uh, they, they, they're not married. They just live together and they have kids and you know, they, they continue to live together and sleep in the same bed and raise their children. And, and, and here we, we don't back a, away from saying, you know what, God's got a plan for, for marriage. And, and, and yet, they keep coming back despite the reality that we're, we're preaching biblical truth because we're loving them. And, and so there's that, that tension... You see? There, there's tension when we preach on things like divorce and remarriage and for those people that are coming in that weekend during the Renewed Bliss series who perhaps have been remarried, for them it's like coming in and sitting in a root canal. You know what I'm saying? Like they dread it, but yet afterwards they're going, you know what, I have children and thank you for preaching and declaring that truth. I want to share this this truth with my children because I don't want them to be where I've been. And so there's that tension between truth and grace. Uh, here's another one. Oh, this is going to be a fun one. You see, sometimes that tension plays out even in our church when I declare that, hey, if you believe in the mission of the gospel and you believe in the mission of Terra Nova Church, you ought to give, you ought to tithe. And yet, some of you don't. You still come in and you soak up our air conditioning and our lights and you participate in the free resources and you still come. There's a tension. We, we delight in the fact that you're here so there's truth, but yet there's grace and you keep coming back. You see, there's a tension. And if you attempt to, to resolve that tension, you're going to miss something. You're going to miss the opportunity that God has for you to love the way that he loved. In fact, John writes in his gospel in uh, John chapter 1, this is, this is like 40 years after he's, he's walking with that first century group of believers. This is like 40 years after he had walked with Jesus and the other disciples. And, and he's really beginning to reflect on what he saw and what he experienced in the life of Jesus. And he begins in John chapter 1, he talks about, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, and he begins to recount the life of Jesus. He begins to recount the reality 
that, that the God-man, that, that God came and dwelled among men. And we're going to pick up in, in John chapter 1, verse number 14. John chapter 1, verse number 14. And he's going to begin to re-instill this reality to us. Okay? Here's what it says. The, the text is right here for you. It says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Like among us. Like, like flesh and blood. It's, it's that term, dwelled among us. It's kind of like a, a camping term. He set up camp. Okay? The Word became flesh and His dwelling was among us. He set up camp with us. And it says, we have seen his glory. Now, John is speaking as in we, me, he. He has seen God's glory. First person. He's seen it. He's experienced it. I, I mean, he, he reclined at the table with the God-man. He says, we have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, who came from the Father, now look at these next few words, full of what? Grace and truth. Say grace and truth. Not, not grace or truth. He came full, full of grace and and truth. Let that one sink in a second. And this word, he came from the Father, it's that word begot or was born of. His existence was that he would come and be full of grace and truth. Did you catch it? There's that tension. The tension we've been speaking of. The tension of grace and truth. There seems to be an apparent conflict between grace and truth. Truth is, you've done it. Grace is, but you're not condemned. Truth is, you're a sinner bound for a sinner's hell, but grace says, I paid the way. You see, he came full of grace and truth. You see, grace would say something like this. Don't worry about it. Truth says, you better worry about it. Grace might say, you're fine. And truth might say, you're wrong. And for us in the Church of America, we tend to slide to one extreme or the other. In fact, I'm just going to be real honest. I, I grew up in the truth church. I grew up in the truth church. We believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God from cover to cover. We even believe the maps. And here's what it says. And if you don't measure up to this, shame on you. They love to, to declare their truth in my life and show me how miserable of a sinner I am. My friend... He went to the Grace Church. It didn't really matter. And, and here's what I discovered. When, it, when, we're, when we're preaching it, and when we're declaring it to others, we all like to be the truth church, right? But when it comes to dealing with us, we're really all about we like grace. But check this out. Check this out. It says... that he came from the Father full of grace and truth. Full. That means to the brim. Check it out. Jesus was a good measure combination, not of one or the other, but he was both. He was both grace and both truth in their fullness. He's both. And for us, it creates a tension. But for Jesus, it's possible. It is possible for him in the fullness to the brim. 
overflowing from him. He's not just truth. He's not just grace. He's grace and truth. For some of you, that's a hard tension. It kind of it, it kind of bothers us a little bit. But now, I, I want you to see what verse 15 says. Go to the next verse there, Laurie. It says, out of his fullness. Now, out of his fullness, because he is full, because he is full of both grace and truth, out of the grace and the truth of Jesus, I want you to see this. Because he's full of both, we have all received grace. We've all received grace in place of grace already given. Let me give you a translation. It simply means blessing upon blessing. Not only were you given grace, but you were given extra grace. You received grace upon grace. Because God sent his son Jesus to be full of grace and truth you and I are here tonight. We are recipients of the full measure, not just a little grace, the full measure of His grace, grace upon grace. We have received His grace upon grace to cover our sin. Hey, that's good news. Point to your neighbor, tell him that's good news. That's good news. But it goes on to say, for the law, for the law was given through Moses. The law was given through Moses. Now, he, he's saying that the law came, and, and it was a standard of behavior, okay? The law came through Moses, and that was a standard of behavior. And not only was there a standard of behavior, there was also consequences every time you missed the mark. You see, Moses brought the law, and he also brought the consequences. And so he's talking about the truth. But grace and truth, grace and truth came or was birthed through who? Jesus. You see, Moses brought the law. He brought the truth. He brought the law, the standard, and the consequences. But whoa, check this out. There's good news in the gospel that Jesus came and he brought with him both grace and truth. And the reality for those of us here today that brings tension. It brings tension. In, in fact, I, I want you to write this one down. Check this out. The next slide. There's not a balance between there's not a balance between in Jesus there is the full measure. The full measure of truth and grace. A full measure of truth and grace. And remember what I said. Every time we try to resolve the tension between truth and and grace, we miss something. We miss the opportunity to really love like Jesus. Because again, though it was messy, though sometimes on the outside looking in it seemed unfair, Jesus always operated in the fullness of both grace and truth. And that's the way he loved people. When you try to resolve that tension, you're going to miss one or the other. Thus, you will not really love like Jesus. Let, let's stop for just a second. Let's just take a deep breath. We see the danger in this. We, we see a church every time that a soldier dies, every time that there's a natural disaster in America, we see the, the extreme of truth. Who puts it on display for us? Westboro Baptist Church. Y'all know who I'm talking about, right? God hates fags. You've seen them. They're this extreme. And then you got the other extreme down here that's grace that's condoning sinful behavior. 
Metropolitan Community Church. I mean, it's a whole denomination with a gay agenda. We, we, we try to create this, this balance, but, but we're not looking for a balance. We're looking for the fullness of both. In fact, we saw it all throughout the ministry of Jesus. We saw this throughout the whole ministry of Jesus. You remember the woman at the well? The Samaritan woman who is at the well? She's, she's there getting water. And she's there in the, the, late, the late part of the day. Why? Because that's when no one else would be at the well. Most women would go before the sun comes up when it's still in the cool of the day or in the evening time as the sun goes down in the cool part of the evening. But the Samaritan woman, she goes in the middle of the day because she wouldn't be seen there. And as she's there at the well, Jesus says, Hey, uh, would, you, would you mind sharing some water with me and use your pitcher? And now, this was kind of uh, different because Jesus being a Jew and her a Samaritan, I mean, you don't even have any sort of dealings with one another. And throughout that conversation, we see that, that Jesus says to her, hey, why don't you go into town and, and get your husband? Uh-oh. And she's like, um, I'm not married. And Jesus says, yeah, I know. I, I know, you, you, you've been married five times. And some would go, Jesus, clearly he didn't go to seminary because you just don't get all up in that kind of stuff. You don't get to dabbling in that stuff. But Jesus says, oh yeah, I know, you've been married five times. And the man that you're living with now, he's not your husband. Uh-oh. That's kind of a hard truth. You see, Jesus walks in the fullness of truth. Right? But he also said something, and he revealed it to the Samaritan woman at the well before he declared it to anybody else. Does anybody know what he said? He said, I want you to know that I am. I am the living Son of God. I am the Messiah. And I'm telling you first. And he says, I want you to go into town. And I want you to sin no more. You see, there was this, this tension. He, he said, I know you come to get water that will satisfy you for a while, but... But if you drink of the living water, you will have the thirst quenched in your life that absolutely no man will ever be able to fulfill for you. You see, Jesus was the fullness of truth and grace. Kind of messes with some of us, I know. And then there's, then there's Matthew. You all remember Matthew, right? He was one of the first followers of Jesus. What was Matthew's occupation? He was a tax collector. Did, did you know him? In those days, nobody liked the tax collector. In fact, I don't think people like him today much either. Um, in fact, um, the IRS is part of a pretty scandalous um, thing right now. But, but in Jesus' day, nobody liked the IRS or the tax man. And, and yet we see this this command, Jesus says to Matthew, hey, come follow me. And, and could you imagine? Could you imagine the other disciples are going, whoa, whoa, time out, Jesus. Time out, Jesus. We lead the First Baptist Church of Jesus. And if we hang out with the tax collector, won't it look like we're condoning his behavior? Jesus, if we, if we invite the tax collector to come hang with us, won't people think we're okay with him ripping off other people? Uh, we just can't have that. That tension, we're supposed to avoid all appearances of sin. That tension, uh oh. And Jesus says, you know what? Not only do I want Matthew to follow us, we're going to go to Matthew's house. We're going to have him invite all of his tax collector buddies over. And we're going to party, man. We're going to have a great meal together. We're going to, like, cook out. Now, Jesus, what if somebody drives by while we're cooking out with the tax collectors? You see, Jesus declared, I don't care what it looks like. Besides, what you all don't know is Matthew's going to give that up altogether before long. You see, in the story of Matthew, there's both truth and grace. 
And sometimes us super religious people, we just can't handle that. And, and then, not only Matthew, there was, there was the criminal on the cross, right? You know, Jesus is there, and he's, he's hung between, but some say that, that they're common thieves. But regardless, he's, he's hanging between two guilty individuals. And, and one declares, we are getting what we deserve. We're getting what we deserve, and no doubt Jesus is like, yep, I know that's right. And, and through the course of the conversation, the one thief says, Lord, when you enter your kingdom, would you, would you remember me? And Jesus did not say, well, we can't let you in. There's no time for you to actually take up your cross and follow me. I mean, you're like on the last minute deal, buddy. I mean, it looked very unfair, right? It, it's, it's unfair that, that he said today. You won't be with me in paradise. I mean, I mean, those onlookers, they're going, wait, 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 that, that, that doesn't seem fair. I'm confused. I mean, the guy didn't even have any time to go through, like, church membership class or to be baptized. And you mean you're going to let him in? You see, there was this tension between truth and grace. The truth is he was a common criminal. He was set to die. And grace said, I love you anyway. You see, when we try to resolve the conflict between truth and grace, we miss something. We miss the opportunity to really, really love like Jesus. And then there's that woman who was caught in adultery, right? The woman caught in adultery, and they were all ready to do what? To stone her. They were ready to stone her. In fact, the law of Moses demands, they said, that we stone such a woman. And so Jesus comes, he says, okay, great, let's do this. Let's do this. But how about... How about those of you who've never committed adultery? Why don't you guys go ahead and start? Uh, why don't those of you that have never gossiped or told a lie, why don't, why don't you all go ahead and start? You, you see, Jesus comes onto the scene as she deserved to die. She had been caught in the act. I don't need to tell you what that means. She was guilty. And, and yet Jesus comes on the scene and says, hey, all you people without sin, why don't you guys just go right ahead and I'll, I'll watch. And one by one, you would hear thud, 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 because there was not one in the crowd there that day that was innocent other than him. And he revealed that day truth in its fullness, she was guilty of the act of adultery. But there in that moment, he showed grace. He said, if no one else can condemn you, then neither do I. Neither do I. You see, Jesus could have said, yeah, well, the law says you can't, or the law says you can. He could have done all kinds of things, but yet he said, I don't condemn you either. Go and leave your life of sin. Here's what I want you to understand tonight. Put up that next screen. If you want to know what he meant when he said, love one another, if you want to see what Jesus means when he says to you and I that his disciples will love one another, if you want to see what he meant, watch how he loved. Watch how Jesus loved. All throughout the New Testament, he loved in such a way that was full of truth and full of grace. I, I can't say that I had this all figured out, but, but I, I do know this, that when it's in when it's in practice in my life, 
my wife usually will say something like, whoa, Chad, you can't say that to them. I said, well, of course I can. It's the truth. She said, but no, you, you can't. That's, I, don't even, I don't know how those guys still like you. I don't understand how Tim Barlett's still your friend. Well, because not only am I declaring truth, I strive to really love them like Jesus. You see, it doesn't have to be and or. It could just be and. Grace and truth. See, if you want to see how he meant love one another, see how he loved. Here's the reality about Jesus. He always, he always called sin, sin. Okay? He always called sin, sin. And then, he paid for it. Mm. Some of you came just to hear that tonight. Jesus always called sin, sin. And then he paid for it. You see, we, we in the church world, we like calling sin, sin, and then setting back in our luxurious seat of judgment. Jesus called sin, sin, and then he went to the cross to pay the price for that sin. And then he declared, I do not condemn you. And he says, leave your life of sin. And then he would declare something like this. But even if you don't, even if you don't, I still love you. Even if you try and you, you get down the road and you fail and you mess up, I still love you. You see, if we want to see what it means to love one another, it's good to look at the life of Jesus. If you find yourself, he says, if you find yourself broken, if you find yourself up to your eyeballs in sin, if someone sins against you and, and you really begin to, to break under the weight of that, guess what? I, I still love you. You see, that's how we've been called to love. There's a tension there. There's a tension between truth and and grace, but if we try to resolve it, we miss something. Now, do not dare lose truth. Don't lose truth. Don't give up truth for grace. We, we still need the truth, okay? Because here's the reality. Put up that next one. Sin has a gotcha. Okay? We need truth. Because sin has consequences and sin has a gotcha. There is a price to pay. We know the truth is that sin always takes you further than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. And it costs you way more than you want to pay. We have to stand as the church on the truth. We have to preach scripture against sin. We have to because when it comes to sin, there is a gotcha. Okay? We're not going to move away from truth for butterflies and rainbows. Do you hear me? Okay? Truth is truth. But then we dare not lose grace. We dare not lose grace because the reality is we need grace because sin already got you. Sin has already got you. You and I, according to Scripture, we were born sinners. And so we all are in need of grace because sin has already got us. The world in which we live, the people you work with, your neighbors, your family, we've got to cling to grace because they need the hope that you and I have found because not only has sin got us, it's got them too. Don't try to, don't try to find the balance. Don't try to figure it out. Don't, don't try to, to find middle ground. Try to love like Jesus and walk in the fullness of truth and grace. Can I be honest? When, when you start doing this, when you, when you start walking in this, you're going you're gonna to piss some people off. See, some of you, you're now so upset 
And you've clung to truth because I said that in worship. You, you, you haven't gotten it yet. You, you're way over here. You're going to preach you're done, said that word in church. And you're more concerned that I said that word in church than still trying to love me like Jesus. You're trying to resolve that. It, it, it's going it's to be weird because you might find yourself at places with people who sin differently than you do. And if you really get it, you're not going to care. You're going to go, and you're going to love like Jesus. You're going to go to where sinners are, and you're going to love like he did. I'm telling you, if you get this, it's going to create some tension. But if you get it, this world, this community, and your family will come to Jesus in a way that we have never seen nor experienced. We will see the birth of a revival like never before if you would really love like Jesus loved. You know what you call it? You know what you call it when a group of liars, when a group of cheaters, when divorced and remarried, when those that are living together, when those that are jealous and greedy, you know what you call it when those people who are covetous, those people that are lustful, those that are porn-watching, tax-dodging, law-breaking people, you know what you get it when a bunch of them and they're on that racist people, those people that go to the buffet and like to eat too much, you know what you call it when all those people get together because they believe in the gospel of Jesus? You call that church. You call that church. That's the church. And when those people come together and they decide that we've been called to be salt and light and they go out there and they walk in both truth and grace, something begins to happen. And there's only one way to make it happen. Grace and truth. This is what I want to end with. The church is at its best. The church is at its best when it embraces both grace and truth. Grace and truth. And it refuses to let go of either. The church is at its best when we refuse to let go of either and we're operating in both of those. You see, as a follower of Jesus, as a disciple, there is a biblical mandate to follow. You're free to walk under the umbrella and the guys of I'm a Christian, all you want. But the Bible is clear as to what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. We're going to close with a time of invitation. Um, if, if you were offended a few moments ago by what I said, I apologize, my heart wasn't to offend you. If you're a child here, it's not okay for your pastor to talk like that, and I don't in public. Try not to in private. Um, but, but there was truth in that. And if you're a parent, I hope you kind of unpack that for your kids. Okay? Um, the truth is, just because I'm a pastor, I'm still a sinner. Just like you. And the truth is, I need the redemptive power and the redemptive work of Jesus in my life. But I also need the grace not only from Jesus, but I need it from you. Because I'll fall short over and over again. So it's with that tonight that I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. I know that tonight's message for many of you, it's created some tension in you. you you've been longing to find middle ground. And some of you used to be truth, truth, truth and you've traveled so far toward grace and you're working on it and you've given up a lot of truth to embrace grace some of you, you've, you've left a lot of grace to embrace truth and Jesus isn't asking you to do any of those things 
He's asking for you to walk in both. To walk in both. I don't know how the Lord is stirred in you tonight, but this is your opportunity to respond to Him. Father God, we come before you tonight. Lord, and I ask that, that God, we would understand the reality that you have called us to be disciples, to be followers of Jesus. Lord, you have called us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow you. Lord, you have mandated that we would love one another like you love us. God, the reality is you've called us to be salt and to be light. And Lord, many of us, we are way too content in our judgmental state to abandon that, to follow you. Many of us, we are too set in our mushy, gushy, I just want to love everybody. But God, you've called us to, to embrace both grace and truth. And so God, whatever that looks like for each of us, God, I pray that we would make it so tonight. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You come tonight. If my heart is overwhelmed, then I cannot hear your voice. I'll hold on to what is true, though I cannot see. The storms of life they come when the road ahead.